Deshaun Foster is paying attention to the details much better than Chip Kelly ever could. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Locked On UCLA Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Ederson. Yox Simer, thanks for making this show your first listen each and every day. It's free wherever you get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for your support. This episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Game off, because we got to talk about Monopoly Go, the fast-paced game that lets you team up with friends for tournaments to unlock awesome prizes and unique stickers for trading and cool playing pieces and hilarious emojis to taunt your friends. Download Monopoly Go for free on Google Play or in the App Store. Where we get started today is the work Deshaun Foster is putting the portal, not just getting players at positions the Bruins need, but paying attention to the details that Chip Kelly just didn't simply care for and didn't want to recruit, which there is a large, wide array of places that Chip Kelly didn't certainly care about when it came to recruiting. But Sean Foster is addressing immediate needs and addressing needs in places Chip Kelly would have never done so. What do I mean? One, we're going to start the big news, which happened over the weekend's whether you're going and partying for Cinco de Mayo, whether you're watching volleyball in the national championship stage, maybe you're watching beach volleyball, maybe you're watching a bunch of things. It was a big sports spring weekend. The Bruins got a pickup from Sharif C. from Florida A&M. He's bounced around, but at three different schools, and UCLA will be his fourth school after a pretty solid season at Florida A&M. The Bruins get another addition on the D-line. Remember, UCLA is already tried to fill as much as they can. They have Collins H. M. Pong. They got Jay Tawia to return from the portal. They've done their best adding to this D-line, and I'm just not saying all the names right now, but Sharif C., former Florida a and edge rusher. That is what the Bruins needed specifically because they didn't want to lose a big guy up the middle like Tawia, but the Bruins desperately needed some talent, some, immediately pl- some immediate talent to plug and play on the edge. And this is what Sharif C brings after a year in Florida AM. This is what his numbers were. A kid from Texas, 6'5, 250 on the edge, 13 solo tackles, had 22 overall tackles, nine and a half tackles for loss, four and a half sacks, and a forced fumble. I think some pretty solid numbers. And that's what the Bruins went out. They saw what they could go get and brought him in. And he is certainly going to challenge for a lot of PT at a spot that desperately needs guys ready to play in 2024. Now, is this someone who's going to develop? No. This is a guy who is a veteran in college football. He has bounced around the college football world, but this is someone I think fits the mold for what UCLA needs at the position this year. Hence, what UCLA needs this year. Because think about it, Deshaun Foster had to pick up the pieces, the broken pieces that Chip Kelly had been kicking, burying, just leaving to decay all around, right, when it came to recruiting, when it came to trying to fund more NIL, donor appreciation, high school recruiting, this year's recruiting, sheer enthusiasm from the fan base. And he's done all those things from a Friday Night Lights practice, a spring game return at the to the Rose Bowl, getting guys in the portal, getting enough NIL funding to get guys who went to the portal withdraw. Mind you, players who withdraw and return to their schools in transfer portal rankings and transfer portal recruiting, usually less than a percent, two percent, very rare, especially when it comes to coaching changes. And the Bruins have gotten all those things. And when it needing to address a position of need, which is already a, a weak link after seeing all the guys leave, the Murphy twins, Shea Brian Strother, Leatu Latu, very talented or would have gotten much a lot of playing time this year. Deshaun Foster has gone and addressed it with the coaching staff going on the road, proving, hey, this is what we're doing. They don't have the boom graphic anymore. They got the Westwood graphic, but they're doing their best to stay up with the times on social media, connect to the recruits. Just go out and look in Southern California. It's a talented place full of very good ball players. Go get some. And when you need somebody in the portal, secure Sharif Say. And also, this is a bit of older news, but we haven't addressed it here on Locked On UCLA. UCLA has gone after. A lot, a lot of options when it came to special teams. Think of what was one of the worst units last year for UCLA under Chip Kelly. Yeah, the offense could have been much better, but special teams 
certainly hampered the offense when it came to the lack of a return game. And it seemed like Chip Kelly was just shooting himself in the foot because he refused to put possible super athletic guys back there like a Keegan Jones, different guys as opposed to players who we, we watched like Colson Yankoff, who I thought is a very athletic kid. It did not seem to work on the kickoff return. One element of that, right? And then you watched the kicking game suffer as it did, which forced UCLA in numerous situations in 2023 to probably go for it when UCLA couldn't kick a field goal. I know Chip Kelly liked to go for it. I'm not sure what type of coach Deshaun Foster is going to be when it comes to the ideal, quote unquote, the ideal riverboat gambler going for it on fourth down. Is he going to be like the recently fired Chargers head coach, Brandon Staley? Fourth down, always go for it or go and kick your field goals. And remember, think about this. Where was Eric Bieniemy re- employed for a very long time with the Chiefs, who kicked a bunch of field goals in the Super Bowl, won in overtime. They got their points. So now the Bruins can move the ball, pin teams deep, and get the operations of the kicking game down. Not that a lot of them were failing, but UCLA had to replace, right? The minute details that Chip Kelly didn't really give a lot of love. And this is a little bit from the likes of guys of who have committed. you got David Dellenbach. A walk-on kicker, UCLA already has two scholarship kickers between Blake Glessner, a previous transfer guy coming into the 23 season from Montana State, and Mateen Bagani, who is the Cal walk-on kicker that stole the job and then transferred over to UCLA. So giving UCLA quite the battle when it comes to kicking, I thought Bagani would be the favorite, but we'll see how it goes. Glessner was a bit of a kickoff specialist kicking things off, but that gives UCLA quite the room to fill out kicking-wise. Think about it. You've already got two scholarship kickers on the roster. You've got the likes of Brody Richter when it comes to a transfer scholarship punter and a scholarship transfer long snapper in Travis DeRosos coming together. That's a lot of scholarships. That's four scholarships between your long snapper, a punter, two kickers, another walk-on kicker. Look at all those guys, four of which just came in this offseason for UCLA to come challenge either the players in the locker room currently shift things. And that's to think UCLA already had a long snapper coming from Elon and Ryan Wilkins. And he, he tweeted, he posted on, on social media that hey, UCLA were, I don't revoke is not the right word, but that scholarship opportunity, that opportunity on the spot for UCLA was no longer available, which also underlies the ruthless life of recruiting, whether you're a head coach, a new head coach, or taking over for a former guy coaches, Send kids packing. Whether they're your fan favorites, unfortunately, maybe it's your kid, whether it's players that you didn't know were on the roster to begin with, which a lot of players get buried deep on a depth chart in football, in college football specifically, and they all like to make their NIL bucks, but a lot of players get buried deep. Deshaun Foster sent a kid packing and brought in a new kid, and that was just at the long snapper position. We wish the best for all the kids who are switching schools, transferring all those things, losing spots, unfortunately, but that is this day and age. Deshaun Foster is being ruthless in a spot that some people hardly remember exists in the game, but it is very crucial to the kicking game, the punting game. And they only come out quite a few times per game. Think about that. That it came down to the long snapper, and I'm not sure what went down that changed UCLA's mind. Maybe Deshaun Foster just wanted to, start the way of letting someone down. I don't know what happened in that in, the, in that conversation and what conversations nowadays in college football are more negotiations with your own players from anywhere from the starting quarterback down to your fifth string, whatever position, trying to keep guys on the roster, negotiating to stay, whatever it may be. Even in the portal, you come in, we'll see what happens. The Bruins are filling what is going to be a void left by Latu and the Murphy Twins in the D-line wanting to revamp a forgotten part of special teams, and then saying, hey, we are going to make this a competitive roster inside and out. That's what Deshaun Foster wants. Compete, compete, compete. Whether it's him recruiting against his the previous head coach, his former head coach, when he was still on the staff last year, it's not like he left that long, did Coach Foster. It's always a competition, and I think Coach Foster is thriving. Now the X's and O's, how it all works, The fourth downs, all these situations, what's going to look like for the kicking game? Will they actually be used? Are they good enough to be used for a 45-yard field goal with a little bit of breeze in Big Ten country in early winter? In late fall, I should say? Now that's all to be determined. But this is the beginning of UCLA addressing needs and Deshaun Foster continuing 
to look at things that UCLA desperately needed. It was just not there when Chip Kelly was head coach. And he is trying to flip the script and make it happen. Off the field, Foster's winning over hearts, winning over players to come to the program. They're competing. They're enjoying it. It seems like from spring practice, social media, of course, that's all PR. Now we just can't wait for spring, for fall ball to begin and the games to go. Because, hey, it'll be actually summer when the UCLA Bruins take the field in late August at Hawaii. That's coming a lot sooner than we think. And that's why you should be here in Locked On UCLA to think about it. Speaking about a lot sooner, the women's basketball season. It's going to be here a lot sooner than we think. A big-time class, a couple spots to fill for Corey Close, and she hits the portal. I know sure at least Ledger Walker, regardless of her injury trajectory coming for this next season, the Bruins are going to have another big name coming in the portal. We'll talk about that next on Locked on UCLA. Let's talk about LinkedIn jobs for a second. Because whether you're hiring for a small business, you're going to want to find quality professionals that are right for your open role. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And it isn't just a job board. It helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively looking for a new job but might be open to a perfect job. Hey, think about this. I had a former boss just announced he's getting he's retiring. I didn't even know. Where did I see that? That was on LinkedIn. Not any social media. I saw that on LinkedIn. Who's going to go try and see the retirement party? Me. And that's because I saw that LinkedIn. Because it's not just the regular job board. Think about it, 86% of small businesses on LinkedIn get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Cruising on here in Locked On UCLA, the Bruin women's basketball team. Corey Close has found herself another solid transfer because they're competing in an arms race in women's college basketball portaling, if you will, with USC. The Trojans who bring back Juju. It, it will be the Bruins and USC who are the class of the Big Ten, no doubt about it, as UCLA, SC, Washington, Oregon all prepare to go from the disbanded Pac-12 into this new day and age in Big Ten play. And with Caitlin Clark leaving the Big Ten, the conference is looking for a new class, a new hierarchy, a new superstar. Well, I'm not exactly saying this transfer portal get is, but the Bruins are trying to assemble a super team to compete with the women uh, on the women's side of you play the women of Troy on that other side. And wh what is UCLA going to do? USC has gotten quite a bit of contenders, right? And still you're at to face with UConn, who's got Becker's back. Corey Close already brought in Charlize Ledger-Walker. Has two or three freshman five stars coming in. A couple of internationals. One a domestic kid coming in. To reload a class that is losing an all-time Bruin great. A four or five-year player in Cam Brown who is extremely, extremely vital to UCLA's roster. You're losing Bessoir who didn't play. Iwala, Zontag. You're losing a lot of important pieces because the Bruins had a lot of injuries, retirements players leaving, going to the portal, all in this last end of the season, and also run out of eligibility. Because if UCLA could have had Osborne back and Brown back, they certainly would have welcomed them back, and they did to the tune of a Sweet 16 appearance. Now, Corey Close needs to either reload slash upgrade at certain spots. And what the Bruins had in 23-24 to 24 at the fourth spot was supposed to be Emily Bissoir's spot, a starter who could stretch, hit the three, score 10-15 to 15 plus points per game, and that was probably some scoring the Bruins desperately needed in some big-time games when the Bruins were without Lauren Betts against Stanford in those two matchups at the end of the year against USC, and most likely in a desperate scenario when they were searching for any scoring and some depth at the four when the Bruins played LSU in the Sweet 16. Tamia Gardner, 6'3 forward, sophomore, who will be heading into her junior season from Ogden, Utah, is transferring, committed to UCLA, from Oregon State. And Oregon State was elite last year. They were competing against some of the nation's best. The Bruins had to fight tooth and nail multiple times against Oregon State. Once in a win, once in a heartbreaking, buzzer-beating loss. And you're going to bring in Gardner, who started her last eight games of the year 
from leap day on February 29th through the entire month of March when Oregon State ran their way in the table in the tournament, beat Notre Dame, who some might have favored over Oregon State in some regards, and competed with South Carolina for a little bit in the NCAA tournament. All double-figure scoring outputs for Gardner, who averaged 11.5 points per game, 7 rebounds per game, and get this, 39% from 3. And if you round up on 39.5%, you get 40% from 3, if you really get about it. 44% from the floor, 88% from three from the free throw line. That's a lot of numbers at you. A lot of those are very good. And replacing, if not maybe an upgrade from Emily Bessoir, nothing against her. She was desperately needed this last year for this Bruins squad. That was already elite, in my opinion, my humble opinion. I still think the Bruins should have beaten LSU and could have very much competed with the likes of Iowa in an Elite Eight game, but that's not what happened. So the Bruins are getting a player who exactly fits the one that they missed the entirety of last season, bringing in another superstar in Charlize Ledger-Walker, wondering how her recovery from her knee injury will go. And all of a sudden, you've got a, a team with still a few spots open, two or three, based on scholarship availability. Women's basketball, you have 15 scholarship spots. And you've already got Kiki, got Lauren Betts, you've got Gardner, who will have two years of eligibility, her junior and senior seasons, meaning she can grow with the superstar class of London Jones, Rice, Betts. Bring in the youngsters, and you've got a team that'll be older with some experience, some young talent, some transfer portal experience. Gardner was a Pac-12 freshman honorable mention, playing half the season. Then, this year, she was the Pac-12 sixth player of the year with an all-Pac-12 mention, right? She was an all-Pac-12 honoree. This is an elite talent the Bruins are getting. Maybe not 18 and a half points per game or close to it from Ledger Walker, but the Bruins are reloading. Quietly close is competing with Lindsey Gottlieb across town. And it will be a, it should be more sellouts next year in Poly Pavilion and in the Galen Center when a lot of the Big Ten, all the hype will be in the Midwest. No, for the women's side, basketball is going to run through Los Angeles. And I think UCLA is going to compete. I think USC will get a lot more preseason hype than UCLA with the name of Juju Watkins, now a household name. But the Bruins are assembling a team. Might not be the Avengers worthy, but they're assembling a really good team, some good names, some familiar faces, former foes turned friends to become a team that has never done what any UCLA women's team does, has done in the NCAA era, make a Final Four, compete in a national championship in the NCAA era of women's basketball, and win one as they try to knock off some top-tier teams, UConn reloading, the team across town, South Carolina, which is 1-1. This is a, an elite opportunity for Corey Close, and I like what she's done to reload in spots that have either been lacking or w was already missing due to an injury last year. So imagine what the Bruins can do with what they're bringing back. So far, I think it's still a, sl a small rotation, but of a lot of talent. And there's still lots to learn from these freshmen coming in who just signed, coming in this class of 24 to 25. Big-time stuff. And it'll be even more fun in the following year when the currently committed but current junior in Siena Betts, Lauren's younger sister, comes to UCLA. Imagine that duo battling down low in the post. That's in a year's time when we're talking about that next year, hopefully after a long UCLA tournament run on the women's side. But be excited. It'll be an elite, extreme battle. Those UCLA-USC women's tickets will be hard to come by, I think. Two, three, maybe four battles next year. Mark my words. We're going to the final segment of Locked On UCLA. We had a national championship crowned for the Bruins, the men's volleyball team. One seat held through and one at the Walter Pyramid. We'll talk about that next on Locked On UCLA Podcast. All right, game off, because we're going to pause right here, talk about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You've already talked about Monopoly Go, but there's just so much good stuff in the game. With Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments, work together to build each other's boards, and the more you win together, heck, it's the more awesome prizes you unlock. There's so much more. Unique stickers, cool new playing pieces, hilarious emojis, all that and more, because I think with Monopoly Go, 
feels new, exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges, and a ton include their own unique mini games. Timed events to help you win big. There's always fun, something to, to discover in Monopoly Go. So go get off the bench and download it now free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. Once again, the elite, the dominant UCLA men's volleyball program wins a national championship. They're 21st in program history, the second in a row, back-to-back -back champs for a team that has long dominated the sport in 23 and 24, a team that brought back a lot of talent from last year's team, but it's a little more fun to win it on the West Coast when it's a lot closer to home than winning it on the East Coast. But you got to win back-to-back. -back. That's how the sport's been going. John Spira, fifth overall title at UCLA, fifth overall title as a head coach, second at UCLA as the head coach, back-to-back. -back. And what's funny is over the last decade plus in the men's volleyball game, when a team has won a championship, they have gone back-to-back. -back. This has been helped out because the COVID season canceled the championship. So every played and completed season has had a back-to-back -back champion dating back to 2012 the champions of UC Irvine, which is where we start with this, right? UCLA had John Spra, who they hired away from, well, he was at UC Irvine, now he's UCLA head coach. He started the run at back-to-backs, right? In 2012, after that, left UC Irvine. Irvine then went back-to-back. -back. Then you had Loyola Chicago, went back-to-back. -back. Ohio State went back-to-back. -back. Long Beach went back-to-back. -back. COVID, then Hawaii went back-to-back, -back, which leads us to now UCLA, which wasn't as dominant as they were in 23, a team that went 31-2, and two, dominated in four sets over Hawaii. And then you've got UCLA, who 26-5 and five, had to scramble and battle against GCU in the MPSF, even losing their conference tournament championship, but still winning a very hotly contested one seed, sweeping through the quarters in the newly expanded edition of the NCAA tournament, eight teams, down, having to come back and beat a Solid UC Irvine team that supported the, the National Player of the Year in which UCLA said, hey, how can we come back and found a way down two sets to one, down in the fifth set against UC Irvine in the Final Four to come and play in the home gym of Long Beach State where they lost earlier in the year to win in a four-set thriller, two-hour marathon for a four-set four match where they won three sets to one, almost could have won it in three, had to battle back, and sported three all-tournament team members, right? And the likes of Andrew Rowan, Merrick McHenry, and the most outstanding player, Ethan Champlin, for a team that was just dominant. They can just go bombs away on the serve. They're just clearly taller and more athletic than practically the whole nation, but it was clearly on display in the nationally televised championship final when UCLA fans had quite a bit of fans in the pyramid, and they were just flat out played nerves of steel. They were right there at the right time, made all the right plays, were making sure Long Beach's best players on the outside and on the opposite were just not going to swing well. Triple blocks put up, everything was game planned by the Bruins, and they showed out in what was an elite finals atmosphere, a pretty solid Final Four atmosphere, and despite losing their conference tournament championship, raced through the championship week, and won a national title overall. 21, and now they're, the ticker keeps going, right? 121, 122. They're keeping climbing an overall national championship. You had Martin Germain running up to an eight claps with the students that came and running around Walter Pyramid, excited for the UCLA fan base. That was treated to another championship. John Spira doing his best job as head man of the UCLA Bruins. And remember, he won a couple of championships as a player in 93 and 95, three as an assistant. So his championships as a Bruin alone, John Spira, seven, three as an assistant, two as a head coach, two as a player, not including the three he won at UC Irvine. So he's got 10 championships dating back from the early 90s to now. So think about it, close to 30 years of volleyball, John Spira has accounted for a third of championships, whether he was playing, assisting, or being the head coach at multiple places. That is what the genius at the helm of UCLA has. Now you wonder, can they go three in a row? Nobody's done that 
in quite some time. And that has not happened in the last decade for sure. They've only gotten two in a row with the COVID season canceling out in 2020. Now, where is UCLA going to be a year from now? I don't know. The championships next year are held in Ohio State, who love to win one on their home floor, hosting it. But overall, the Bruins are celebrating. Had a great time. He had Champlin, who was very emotional on the court after the Bruins won the championship, but found themselves as back-to-back continuing the men's volleyball national champs trend over the last decade plus. So congratulations to the Bruins, who were a very dominant team. They looked like it on the floor and were pretty much dominant in almost every stat there needed to be in the final coming cup in the clutch from behind in the final four against a very stout, scrappy UC Irvine team and found themselves a champion for the 122nd time and found they were the team that beat the 27 home court win streak by Long Beach State. Unstoppable, it seemed like team of destiny which is we're going to wrap up here they released the big 10 men's basketball conference schedule pairings we'll talk about that recruiting way too early top 25 rankings are mick cronin and the bruins getting overlooked how's that possible cronin's put in work in the portal we're going to talk about that next on the next episode of locked on ucla but in the meantime bruins fans get your hands up it's a clap time baby and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A. U C L A. Fight, fight, fight. This has been locked on UCLA. I'm Zach signing off saying, Go Bruins.